Welcome, everyone. Yeah, um, I'm going to sing a song called Free Spirit. And uh, it came to me before this retreat that I was to sing this song. It's been kind of away for a long time. Um, and this morning I woke up and my heart was just pounding fast and my pulse was high and I was just praying, what is this about? And and then I remembered that <clears throat> last time um, this song was um, sang in, in public was at our mystery school two years almost two years ago. And we were a group of us um, singing some songs. And, um, and in the middle of the concert for the mystery school, uh, our friend Lilo, she burst into tears uh, in the middle of this song. Um, and we had to stop and uh, and wait for her healing, and um, yeah. So so I put this song away for a long time, and uh, but it came so strongly to me to sing it this weekend. But yeah, I don't even know if I will make it through. But uh, yeah, but it's all for us. It's a very very deep song, deep lyrics takes us all the way. So. <clears throat>
Must be wrapping up guidance when we come into that feeling. You could feel that feeling in your heart, free spirit flying like on wings through through like a bird soaring higher and higher and higher into the expansive sky. That's a symbol for all of us and wow, how beautiful to merge with that. That's kind of where we're we're going this summer. We're, we tried to open to be to talk about guidance, and um, and we're going to take that and just waft up on those wings today. Just go higher and higher, using using your prayers, your expressions beyond the examples, beyond the metaphors beyond the bodies, free spirit, like that. Uh, such a peace, such a peace with that. So we're going to use, a, I think today, with that beautiful song as a launch, we're just going to use some of the things that you've written in, the questions, as, as launching into this expansive state of mind, this state of oneness. Rolling off of the Matrix movie, you are the one, you are the one. And going into that experience, beyond the examples, beyond the practicalities of, of time and space, into the one, into the realization that there is just the one. And we thought we would start off with, uh, with a nice little uh, parable. They're, they're actually, uh, it was actually Lynn Robin Miller, I believe from Oregon, who had, had written in a question. And uh, Lynn writes, Hi David and Francis, first of all, when you were traveling, Guided by spirit in the 1990s, did you ever hitchhike? Because my husband and I picked up and put up for the night a hitchhiker named David, who said that he was traveling without anything but clothes on his back in order to experience trust in spirit. The cool part is that the name David kept coming to my husband in meditation that morning before we left. So there, that's an example of, of a kind of a parable question, you know. And the funny thing is, I think Oregon was the site, Lynn, of um, one day when I, I actually picked up three hitchhikers in my little uh, three-cylinder car. And the name of the car was the Spirit. It, there's actually a, it was a Chevrolet. Spirit, and and actually, it was a tiny car. 
a stick shift, and I was driving along, I picked up the first hitchhiker, then I picked up the second hitchhiker, and then I saw this man praying on the side of the road when I slowed down, and my eyes got big and his eyes got big, and he was like, I think I was in Oregon actually, out where you live, and I was on the highway, and he was like leaning over, like, pretty please, pretty please, like, and I already had two hitchhikers, one in the passenger seat and one in the back, and then I had a pile of clothes. That was my way of traveling. I had a, a pile of clothes and behind me in this little tiny car. And I rolled down the window and he's like, please, 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 please. And I said, I will open my door and lean forward. If you can get your body into the car <laughs> over these clothes, um, you can you can come with us. We already have two hitchhikers in the car. So I picked up a third hitchhiker, and this guy was a pretty big guy, and he squeezed in, and his head went over the clothes, and his tummy was on the clothes, and you know the little between the bucket seats, his little head popped out. I'm in. I said, okay, let's go, <laughs> and away we went for about an hour. And then finally, I saw a rest area that had kind of camping area, and I said, listen, we are four stinky guys, and we've been having a great talk about God and a great philosophical talk, but I'll spring, I'll pay for showers. <laughs> Let's stop off. So after we drove a while, me and these three hitchhikers, we actually, um, I, I said, I'll, I'll go. We, we, they had showers, we drove a little more. It was so much joy, all talking about God. In fact, the people, I, the hitchhikers I picked up, they would say when they got in the car, wow, I was feeling all this love, I was feeling God, and then you picked me up. And they were literally witnessing to the glory of God. So we had the, the three hitchhikers and I. But your question actually was asking if Francis or I had, had a hitchhiking experience and I would say, after years in the 1990s of picking up hitchhikers, guided, you know, Jesus had the steering wheel, he would pull over and I would notice, oh, here we go again, another hitchhiking experience. I picked up many hitchhikers on my travels when I was driving around. One time, though, I was in Upper Peninsula of uh, Michigan, and I went to one of these rainbow festivals. I don't know if you've ever heard of rainbow festivals, but they're, yeah, they're out in national forests. They, they have park rangers on horses from a distance watching this group, massive group of people. They, we had a rainbow festival in the woods of Upper Peninsula, northern Michigan, and we had a Jesus kitchen and a Buddha kitchen, and there was rain, and people were sweating, people were running, running around naked. Uh, it, it reminded me of something that I've seen on like Woodstock or something. And it was hot and humid and sweaty and rainy and there was thousands, tens of thousands of people there. And I remember when I first got there, I walked down this tunnel, tiny little crack in all the people. And as I walked down, everybody I, I passed was doing the Namaste with me. And they all would say the same thing, welcome home brother. Welcome home, brother. You know, I thought, wow, I'm in the middle of some kind of a 60s love-in or something like that. I felt like I was in Woodstock or something, except this was probably this, the 1990s instead of the, the 60s with Woodstock. So there got to be a point where I was there, and then I got the strong guidance to, uh, to leave after a couple days. So I walked up among these droves of people to the top of the mountain or the hill where I was, where there were rows and rows, streets lined with, these are highways lined with parking, with cars parked, cars parked. And as I'm getting to the top, I'm thinking, well, I have no car. I am in the middle of a big mass rainbow gathering. It's sweaty. It's nighttime, but I think I'm supposed to go, Jesus, so I think I've picked up a lot of hitchhikers. <laughs> I think I need to be picked up um, and taken away. So I got to the top, and I remember walking, walking along these rows of empty cars, you know, locked up empty cars, and I walked for maybe like a half a mile, and then I met this guy, and we struck up this joyful conversation talking about 
God and love and oneness and everything. And finally, after about 15 minutes, he's, he looked at me and he said, I am guided to leave. I am leaving now. And I said, you are? Well, that's what I, I, I could just walk to the top with my little bag here because I'm guided to leave too. He said, great, get in. And I was like, oh, here comes my hitchhiking <laughs> experience. Uh, so I hopped in the car with him and he said, where do you want to go? And I said, well, I think if you could drive me to Wisconsin <laughs> from, I don't know, it was like a couple hours uh, down to w the border of Wisconsin. I think if you just drop me off at a, at a restaurant or something like that in Wisconsin, I'll be fine from there. And he, we had the best conversation. He literally picked me up. I was like a hitchhiker, a mental hitchhiker, thinking I'm leaving, I need a ride. Jesus, I need a ride. And there was my time to hop into the car to be the hitchhiker. And, and he took me two hours, I made it to a restaurant, I called an assistant of mine, Kathy Martin, who was down at the Peace House in Cincinnati. I said, Kathy, I'm at this little tiny town, a name of the town in Wisconsin, I need to make it back to Cincinnati to the Peace House. Can you make arrangements? And she said, sure. So, and I did. So yeah, I would say the hitchhiking experiences I had, mostly picking up hitchhikers, was all like you and your husband. It felt, it was like a guided experience. It was never at random. These were just holy encounters that uh, Jesus wanted me to have with hitchhikers. And the most I ever had was picking up those three hitchhikers, I think, in Oregon. But actually, um, it, it was really good because I don't think I really had much fear of um, picking up strangers because Jesus was teaching me there are no strangers. Uh, you know, every brother, every sister is the beloved. It's you. It's literally you. So this is just going to expand your mind. And they always had holy encounters. We always got into these deep experiences, really huge, miraculous experiences. But it was also very involuntary. I would just be driving down the highway, because I drove a lot around the United States and Canada back in those days. And I would be driving along in a state of just giving it all over to Jesus and the Spirit. And then I would notice seeing somebody on the side of the road ahead and then I would see Jesus like literally like turning the wheel pulling over because I was like always I'm, I'm not driving you drive you lead me you know when you get into the flow of that it's like literally people feel that sometimes where something takes over their body um, that's the way I felt when I was just sitting meditating driving and I would the wheel would turn and I would go oh, here we go again uh, another hitchhiker, you know, because David had never picked up, before the course, I, I didn't really even like to travel, much less travel and pick up hitchhikers. That was way out of my realm, way beyond my the David's realm. And then it was part of learning to trust and just really greet everyone with this love. But it was also like Jesus was doing the selecting. These were like prearranged encounters. And even when I would go to rest areas, I, or like a, a hostel, I would stay in a hostel and then I would check in and then I'd see somebody in the kitchen and Jesus would go, tomorrow you're going to talk to her and have a holy encounter. I'd say, really? Okay. Then the next morning I would just wake up, he would arrange for me, he arranged the encounters, he arranged the hitchhiking and he also arranged who I was to talk to. So it's a very specific plan with there are no accidents, nothing is at random, and when you get into the flow of purpose, everything is totally given. It's just part of the yes, you know, it's like an, when you say yes, then it comes to you, and, and you said your husband had, had heard the name David before you even got in the car, and then the hitchhiker you picked up was David. So those are the kind of synchronicities that show you that it's part of the miraculous plan. And there's so much joy with that. I, I, I never realized I could have so much joy picking up hitchhikers or being picked up as a hitchhiker. You know, that was a big kind of thrill when Jesus flipped, the, flipped it around and said, now it's your turn. <laughs> now it's your turn to hop into a car with somebody you just met. Uh, it's your turn to do it. So thank you. 
because we, we do share these parables because they are practical. And then Francis and I both noticed your second your question. Second, uh, question. This is all part of share number two. Right. You want to read the, the yeah. part with the next? Yes. Next, there is more of an intellectual question, but it has been pressing on my mind. I'm trying to reconcile the following. In ACAM Lesson 135, there is a statement to the effect that what could you not accept if you but knew that everything that happens, all events, past, present, and to come, are gently planned by one whose only purpose is your good. Yet much of the Course seems to talk about how we attract circumstances to ourselves, such as sickness due to our unhealed thoughts, especially, specifically the level of guilt in our minds. So what is the interplay between these concepts? Is it that we attract circumstances like coronavirus, but the Holy Spirit uses them as can best benefit each of us? Because the statement in Lesson 135 is quite a broad, all-inclusive, and empathic in saying that everything and that happens and all events are planned by the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much. Great question. Yeah, this is good. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. When, when Lynn is saying, how does this all things work together for good? How does this, what could you not accept if you but knew everything that happens, all events past, present, and to come are gently planned by one whose only purpose is your good? How do I learn to let all things be exactly as they are? These are all ideas from the Course, which are the highest idea. It's just like, it's the forgiven world, it's the happy dream. There's no way that you can have an experience of that line and that statement without yielding into the happy dream. Because without yielding into the happy dream, then the mind is thinking of itself as a body or in a body. And um, as long as the mind has that role of a body and it sees itself as in that role or in that body, then the songs coming to mind this morning, everybody plays the fool sometime. There's no exception to the rule. Listen, baby, maybe factual, maybe cruel. I ain't lying. Everybody plays the fool. Every exception to the happy dream is a denial of the happy dream. Every thought that is an exception to, to forgiveness is, is an, a denial of forgiveness. It's an attempt to hold on to grievances. It's an attempt to play small as a person. It's an attempt to play separate as a person. And so I'm glad you're raising that because this course, he says, this course will be believed entirely or not at all. This, this course, he says in other places, this course is not a play of ideas. So even when you seem to be a course student and you read course authors that are talking about the course, giving their interpretations, all of it has to go. All of it has to go. The we all. We all. Sometimes people say, we, 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 we. Don't we, we on the, the happy dream. Uh, please don't we, we on the happy dream. The happy dream is singular. The happy dream is one. The happy dream is unified consciousness, unified awareness. Muji talks about it. Adyashanti talks about it. Eckhart Tolle talks about it. I talk about it. Unified. Unified means one. Even when people bring up the collective, you know, it's just another excuse. There is no collective. Collective what? Is that supposed to be like group consciousness? Is that what collective means? There is no group consciousness. There's only one mind. And that mind either recognizes itself or it does not. If it recognizes itself, that's where the forgiveness comes in. That's the forgiven world. That's the happy dream. Everything else is an attempt to make exceptions. And some of them are, are just intellectual justifications. You know, when people say, well, I'm doing my forgiveness lessons, but I'm only one person, um, I'm doing my part, but, you know, the collective, 
what are you supposed to do? You know, it's like the collective is dark energy. You know, I'm trying to be as happy as I can as a person, but the collective, you know, what can you do with the collective? Well, you can give up the collective. You know, you can give up believing in the Borg. If you're a Star Trek fan, the Borg was an enemy. The Borg is like a Borg is the symbol of the, yeah, the collective unconscious. <laughs> I call them the Borg are like the collective unconscious. They say they're one mind, but they are pretty serious for one mind. I think they're pretty serious. And then they're trying to assimilate, take in other species. You know, they're trying to, in, trying to overcome the Federation. They would love to assimilate the Klingons and the Romulans and Captain Kirk or Captain Janeway or any of the, the ones who are into individuality, the Borg want to assimilate individuality. But they can't really be one mind if they think there's something outside of them that they want to assimilate. Because the very idea of assimilating is taking. They're trying to take over minds to get more for the collective. And that's just another joke too. So I think the most important thing is to start to see that that when you say, much of the Course seems to talk about how we, whoever that is, attract circumstances to ourselves, such as sickness, due to our, our unhealed thoughts in, in our minds, you know, this is all from, from the level of separation, um, as if the interpretation is the Course is saying, we as people, as separate minds with private thoughts, attract external situations outside the person that are negative. Coronavirus you mentioned, or it could be any form of death, sickness, struggle, competition, fighting, lacks, protest, whatever. We're, this morning I was saying that that the mind, Jesus uses the metaphor for a split mind, is saying there's a right mind and a wrong mind. So, Jesus may use symbols like sit, sit quietly and close your eyes, or open your eyes. He, he can use metaphors in the Course as if they relate to a body. So he's trying to make it somewhat reachable, like, like when you're doing the lessons and reading the text, that you can kind of relate to what he's talking about. And then he starts coming higher and higher to the point of saying, the right mind sees that only the mind is causative, and the wrong mind believes that, that bodies, persons, the world has causation. But he's saying the wrong mind is not true. So ultimately you can start to realize, if I just start to talk of the mind, and I start to realize that I don't want I don't desire wrong-minded, fragmented perception. Then Jesus is saying, okay good, we're in the tractor beam here. I don't want wrong-minded perception. I don't want to make exceptions to this unified awareness. I don't want to make exceptions to happy dream. I don't want to make exceptions to forgiven world. You can see how energetic, how the energy goes higher and higher, the frequency goes higher and higher because it's not trying to figure anything out intellectually with the we all. You know, we all, we humans, we, we, we course students, we course teachers, we, we, we. We're not going to we, we, we during the, the guidance retreat. We're going to stop the we, we. <laughs> and what's the French, the French interpretation of we is yes. We means yes in French. We're going to go with the French interpretation of yes. What came to mind too was that, that Jesus has asked the question in the Manual for Teachers, how is healing accomplished? And he talks in there and he says, healing is accomplished when you come to this one recognition that the mind and not the body is the decision maker. Wow, the mind and not the body. If the body is not the decision maker, that means people don't decide. If the mind is the decision maker, then the right mind, the atonement, is available as a correction towards heaven. 
if I continue to insist on the we, 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 if I continue to take the course and try to bring it down into time and space, as if this precious light would come into time and space and that I have to, as a person, make the right moves, make the right decision. That's what I was talking about yesterday. That's like trying to look in the crystal ball and saying, Jesus, will you help me uh, make some sense of this crystal ball? He's like, no, I can't. You will never understand that crystal ball of time and space because it, it wasn't created by God. It, it, you can't bring the light into it. You can bring it to the light and it will disappear, but you can't bring the light into it. So today we can all say, I will accept atonement. I want to see that the, only the mind is where the decision is. Only the mind is where the escape hatch is. Only the mind is where the freedom is. Only activating the mind by forgiveness and atonement brings me to the experience of being a, a free spirit that, that Sava was singing. That's it. It's so simple. It's, it's, this is the direct path. And all guidance, as I said on the first two days, all guidance is to bring us to the present moment. All guidance is to say, I desire the holy instant, and then I take my hands off the wheel. I desire the holy instant, I will be shown. Even the I need do nothing section of the Course is saying, here, practice this one thing and, and show me your true allegiance. I need do nothing. Because the doer is the exception. The doer, the person, is the denial of the unified mind. The very idea of a body as an individual is a denial of the happy dream. The very idea of a, of a doer uh, is completely a denial of the happy dream. So that's why when we have a merging experience and we see, oh, everything is one, everything is mind, that is everything. That's, that's the whole point of A Course in Miracles. That's the, that's the point where the Course can be laid aside, literally. And then we also had uh, Malfried. I think that relates to what uh, Malfried was sharing today. Should I? Yeah, Malfried. Our beloved Malfried, we've, who oh, we've loved and known for years over in Norway, and, and her son KJ, and we've had all these beautiful encounters. And Malfried wrote a beautiful uh, question. question. Dear David and all others, thank you for the session. I have had several awakening experiences. I will mention two. I was sitting having a morning coffee in a cafe and all of a sudden consciousness recognized itself, within itself. I saw how all was one or better, there is only the one and all daily staff had no meaning and no value whatsoever. The consciousness was everything and I was all of it. This stayed with me for like three days. Another time, I woke up one morning as the intense realization, I am eternity. I just was it. I saw inner and outer glowing light for days. I was swimming in it. Every normal action went on in this light. The intensity of it faded. Why is it that the awareness of light or heaven or truth is not permanent? Heaven is permanent. Somehow I know this is already heaven right here, but I'm not intensely aware of it. What my awareness is not permanent. Why is it so? With love, Morfield. Yeah. And the answer to that why, which is, which is similar to uh, Robin's question as well, the answer to the why can be found in the instructions to the workbook. Because Jesus only gives two instructions. And his first instruction is don't do more than one lesson in a day. But the answer to your question 
is found in the second instruction. <laughs> the second instruction from Jesus, only two instructions, that's pretty cool. For the entire workbook, just two instructions. The second one is, as best as you can, try not to make any exceptions to the idea for the day. So he's saying that the idea for the day can take you all the way to heaven through the happy dream. And the second instruction is do not make exceptions. So that's, that's where the foolishness comes in, where the question can even arise, the question of why do I drift out of this? Why does this oneness experience, this merge experience, seem to have a beginning and an end? Why did it start while well, I was drinking my coffee or when I'm sitting quietly in my house like you're doing now, and then it goes, it's vast, it's intense, it's deep, and then the, the mundane. Why is there the mundane? Why do I return to human daily life, we'll call it, uh, <laughs> without coming up with a better phrase for it, human daily life. Is, is another word for the collective unconscious. <laughs> human, everyday, normal, human daily life is another word for sentence to describe the collective, collective unconscious. So that's why the practice is make no exceptions. That's why for me, I think why Jesus took me out on the road early on was he was like, okay, you've You've used the book as an oracle, you've read this book through and through, you've read this book. I have gave you this book just as a starting point and, and I, you've, been, you've used it so fully, so, so fully in these early years. And it's almost like, let's get out of the classroom and into the, the laboratory. Let's really have some fun in the laboratory, taking me, what? I don't like to travel. Yeah, we're traveling. What? How will we travel? Where are we going to get the money? Don't worry, I'll take care of that. And then I'll speak through you. What? You'll speak through me. No, I was voted most quiet. You don't. You got the wrong, the wrong guy. No, I don't. Uh, you know, it's it's you. When you say yes in a big way, you're basically saying I will give my heart to not making exceptions to this experience. And then these two experiences that you had, how glorious! You have like a glimpse of the totality, a glimpse of the vastness, a glimpse of the connectedness, a glimpse of, you call it consciousness, recognizing itself within itself. That's a, that's a beautiful phrase, consciousness recognizing itself within itself. That's really bringing everything back to the mind. And that's what Jesus has said for us, you are mind, you are holy mind, you are purely mind. You, when you believe in a body self-concept, your mind is gone from awareness. And when you're aware of yourself as mind, or we could say unified mind, or unified awareness, or call it unified consciousness, whatever you, words you want to use, the body is gone. When you were in those experiences, you weren't thinking about bodies. Uh, there just are no bodies in that unified awareness. And, and that is experienced through not making any exceptions. And how would that even look in terms of time and space? Well, one thing we can say is that it's simultaneous. So, I know sometimes I hear different Course in Miracles teachers that talk about the ego script and the Holy Spirit script. What a bunch of baloney that is. There's not ego script and Holy Spirit script. That's like taking the script is written idea and then slicing it into two pieces and going, oh, this is an ego piece and a Holy Spirit piece. The Holy Spirit just sees a unified world because the mind is unified and there's no world outside of the mind, then it has to be of, uh, everything is flowing, is, everything is spontaneous, everything is synchronistic, everything is inclusive as you have shared in that experience. That's what is so. 
What you have written is what is so. That's what is so. And then this so-called construct of linear time, we could call it the status quo. You know, when people meet for coffee or a sandwich, how are you doing? Eh, you know, there can be a, a billion, trillion different answers to that from the ego. How are you doing? It's like saying, how in the relative world of daily, normal, day-to-day -day living, how are you doing? That is like much ado about nothing. Who, who cares, <laughs> really, in the ultimate sense? Because that's not the, that's not the happy dream. That's, that's just again saying, okay, I'm a separate individual, you're a separate individual. How are you doing as a separate individual? Well, it's, you really want to know the, the truth, it's unbearable. <laughs> Why, let's be honest during this cup of coffee. How are you doing? Unbearable. Can you elaborate? Intolerable. Can you say a little more? I feel like I'm stuck in my skin. <laughs> Can you elaborate on that? Separate. <laughs> you see? This is all the ego can, can do, but it tries to normalize this, you know, as if like, I'm separate, you're separate. In fact, I remember this book that came out one time, it's like, I'm okay, you're okay. That's not, that's not okay. If, there's, if, there, if I'm separate from you, it's not okay. Then the next book came out, same author, I'm not okay. You're not okay, but it's okay. Oh, come on. How many times are you going to write these books? You know, that's like having a sequel to The Matrix. Why do you need a sequel for The Matrix when the whole thing was about awakening to oneness, knowing that you're the one? There is no sequel that comes after knowing you're the one. So, so the question of why do I drift back into this other separate, fragmented perception state is, has to be taken off the screen and, you, and instead you could turn it around, you could come back into consciousness and say, wow, let's just look in my mind, is there any exception that I still want to hold of seeing pure innocence, of experiencing pure innocence, of being a free spirit? What is the exception that I still had a, have a wish to hold? We're just talking in a mind, really going into the mind. We're not talking about looking outside and trying to find the solution somewhere in form. We're just saying, coming back with huge self-honesty, huge self-honesty, where am I still believing I can make an exception? Do I still have a grievance? Can I find a grievance? It's like, go, that's what true meditation is, is going down into the stillness toward the light and then observing, oh, is there any ex exceptions? Is there any exceptions to the light that I can still find? Self-honesty, that's why it's self-inquiry. It's self-contemplation, it's, it's into the mind. So I'm glad you're raising that, because that one why, <laughs> I, here's the glimpse, and there's why is there something other than the glimpse is really your question. Why, why is there something other? And, and the only way to realize that there isn't is to come to that really direct self-honesty. And that's actually what our our whole retreat is about. Guidance, the direct path to God. Guidance. It's, it's truly coming into that intuitive sense, like, like yielding to the intuition. Even though the ego tries to put it out, what should I do today? Hmm. Well, yeah, let me take that to heart. Am, what am I really inspired? Like, the only way I'm going to be done through is to tap into the inspiration. Am I to say something or not? Am I to speak something? Am I to write or to dance or to sing? I still remember when I, when you came down to Mallorca 
for that devotional and you, you sang and you played your instrument and you beamed and you glowed during that devotional, that was toward the end of the devotional, you, you expressed, you, you got in touch with some, something that was inspiring, that needed to be extended and, and, you, and you expressed. That's artistic expression is really, I would say, just tapping into guidance, you know, because you're tapping into a gift, you have a gift to give. And ultimately, if we go deep into the mind, we get so in touch with that gift of, oh, I'll call it presence, that gift of presence, that gift of alignment. It's a huge gift, it's absolutely huge, but the only way we can receive it in awareness is by giving it. And then as you give it, and you give it, and you give it, and you give it, the form starts to fade away, the form starts to be irrelevant. You, even the thoughts of the form just disappear. The, you, you, are, you are expanded in the giving of the gift. And in the end, the Christ idea is a, is a gift. Jesus was just an example of giving away the Christ idea. The Christ presence was just shining and shining and shining and radiating. And then, for what do we have for Jesus? Well, Jesus says a couple times in the Course, forgive me your illusions. What he's saying is, just forgive that role that I seem to play in history, because you won't find the Christ in history. Forgive the man, forgive the apostles, forgive Galilee, forgive time. Forgive history, come into that vastness, that glimpse that you're talking about. Come in with a warm invitation into that glimpse. And let that glimpse be extended to forever. And make no exceptions as you go towards that glimpse. Make no exceptions as you go into the holy instant. That's, that's it. This is, that's the ultimate of guidance, is just that. It's so radically simple. It's not a complicated thing with many pieces or parts. There's no analysis involved in it. It's, it's basically yield into it. And notice if there's any hesitation towards that yielding. Just notice it. But be willing to give that over too. <laughs> Say, take this resistance from me. Take this thread of doubt from me. Take this, take this wish to make an exception from me. Purify my heart. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Be a flame. That sounds like uh, the Khalil Gibran book we were reading, you know. Let love throw whatever you believe you are into the fire, and let the fire consume all beliefs of separation. That, you know, that's the prayer. That's the prayer. So thank you. Your, uh, your expression is very important for us, and we love you so dearly. You can, yeah, we can, you can ask a question. Hello. Thank you for all of that. I know, I know what the exception was. I remember it so when you talked about it. And it, the exception was, even if I was in that experience, there was an absolute no, uh, to suffering. I don't accept suffering. I remember it, it, it didn't take away the experience, but it was such a no there. Yeah. It was exactly that. Well, when, when there's a thought of, of um, suffering, it, again, the Spirit is encouraging us. I remember I was doing the workbook lessons, and one day I opened up to do my lesson, and Jesus said, if pain is real, there is no God. And if God is real, there is no pain. And I thought, oh, oh, that's, that's strong, that's strong. Because there are no exceptions to love. Uh, it's not, it's beyond love is all we need, it's like, 
it's really love is all there is. Love is an experience without an opposite. So, if I have a glimpse, I have a glimpse of vastness, of, of singularity, of, of all is one or all is connected. And just the, the thought of suffering that there ever could have been, ever can be, or ever could be in the future, suffering. You know, this is where the Christ, Jesus awoke from the time, the dream of time and space. The first teaching of the Buddha is life is suffering, right? The first teaching of the Buddha. Nada, 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 nada to the first teaching of the Buddha. Because Jesus is saying life is eternal. That's why it was all God, God, why do you call me good? Only God is good. God, God, God. In fact, Jesus even says, you should not experience awe except in the presence of your Creator. There is only one thing greater than the Christ, which is the Creator of the Christ. And I'm not talking about Jesus the man, I'm talking about the Christ idea. So Jesus is an awake mind that is going nada, nada, nada to the first teaching of the Buddha. Because the Buddha didn't awake. Christ is the, he was the first expression, the full expression of God is real, love is real, and this world is not. Life is not suffering, life is joy, life is eternal bliss, life is happiness. Life is not emptiness. Life is, is not nothingness. You know, even the, the Buddhas are saying there is no deity, but actually this deity is not a belief. This is an actuality. Eternal life is real. And so, this world of time and space, that's why I was talking about the crystal ball. Look, remember I said I played the witch yesterday? <laughs> Come over here, my pretty. Look into my crystal ball. Yeah. And inside the crystal ball, then there's this belief that life is suffering. So, so suffering is impossible. And, and suffering, the belief in suffering, is the exception. As you go into the vastness, the belief in suffering, there are no beliefs in heaven. There's no beliefs in oneness. Believing, even believing in God is unnecessary, for God can be but known. And you can't know God until you first experience the unreality of separation. So, Jesus is like saying, you have all these time-space beliefs, and all these time-space thoughts that are part of the crystal ball. And he's saying, the only thing you have to do is realize is that this everything of this crystal ball is unreal. There's not a single aspect of time and space that has any validity or any reality whatsoever. And he's saying, just notice if the thoughts come and it wants to be an exception. You have vastness, 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 here comes this little, teeny little mat. Suffering, suffering's real. Suffering, suffering, suffering. Suffering succotash. Suffering. It's just a thought, it's a temptation, it's, it's, it's a temptation that denies the truth. So, I remember another part when I was going through the workbook and, and Jesus said, the truth is true. I said, what? The truth is true. He said, yeah, the truth is true and only the truth is true. You must accept the second part of the sentence to accept the first. Truth is true, and only truth is true. You have resistance to the first part. Truth is true. I mean, the first time I read Truth is True, I, I, I was like, what do you think, I'm in kindergarten? What is this, the truth is true? No, he said, no really, the truth is true. So when you bring up suffering, that is, that is not accepting the second part of the sentence, that only the truth is true. Suffering is not true. 
Suffering has no validity. Suffering has no reality. The belief in suffering is an ex exception, is an attempt to make an exception to the truth. If only love is real, or as he told us at the beginning of the book, the introduction says nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. So we could say you can take that route or you can take truth is true and only the truth is true. You can take either of those routes. He does it again in, in the, the workbook where he's, uh, I will not value what is valueless. And, and I remember coming to lesson 133 and I'm like, okay. He starts off lesson 133 by saying, truth can have no exceptions and basically you still believe in the temporary. He's basically saying only what will last forever is real in that lesson. And anything else other than what will last forever, you know, he's giving criteria for accepting the truth in there. Anything that will not last forever has no value whatsoever. And only what will last forever has value. Now let's all be, let's just take him at heart with this lesson. Let's just follow him on lesson 133. He's asking us to only value that which will last forever. He's just asking us to pull our mind away from all the beliefs of time, all the beliefs of the body, all concerns. He's asking us to dive into divine providence. He's asking us, he said, if you, if you want to value currency, why don't you value the present moment? Uh, because that's your currency. Your currency is not euros. Your currency is not dollars or pesos. Your currency is presence in the present moment. That's your currency. Value currency. You value what's truly valuable, what will take you into the valuable. That takes you right into the development of trust because everything that we have been programmed as human beings. Everything the ego gave us as a human being has been survival of the body. That's the story. That's sort of the value has been placed. And when you are so willing to trust guidance that you say, I may appear to be foolish to the world, but I value peace of mind more than everything that the world teaches. I value that vastness of, of, of the experience of, of love. I value love more than everything else that the world would say I need or the world would offer me. You know, it's like I value the experience of connection more than the crystal ball, than anything in that crystal ball. And it's a leap of faith. Jesus is saying, I know that for you that's going to be a leap of faith because you believe there's some safety and security in the time and space. And, and he's saying, I'm telling you, no, it's, it's just not the case. Come and be with me. Come and be one with me and know our oneness with God. That's, that's the whole pull. And, and so really, I, I had to take that as not as a challenge. I saw that as an invitation. I saw that as an invitation to adventure. He's like, come join with me in guidance and I will take you on the adventure of your life. I will take you to eternal life through this adventure that you're perfectly taken care of as you're with me. You have no needs as you're with me. You have no concerns as you're with me. You have no worries as you're with me. And then you really get to look to see if there's any exceptions to as you are with me. In, in the most basic way, like with any thought. So to me, that again was a surrender. That was my lesson yesterday, wasn't it? Salvation of the world depends on me. Depends on my mind. It doesn't depend on David. <laughs> If the salvation of the world depends on David, 
I, 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 feel, I would feel bad for the world. <laughs> That's a hopeless situation. But if salvation of the world depends on me, and I identify with mind, with mind, you are holy mind, you are purely mind, you are nothing but mind, everything is mind, then I am, am freed up, because then I can see everything as an idea, and I only want to give ideas of love away. I can't really, projection's not giving, projection is, is attempting to get rid of something, but, but love gives of itself. And so that's the thing. So I'm glad you, you brought up uh, suffering, because, because suffering is, is, you have to open up to the idea that suffering is inconceivable. You have to, you have to open up to the impossibility of, of suffering. Also you have to open up to the impossibility of attack. If attack were real, then suffering would be real. And if attack isn't real, if, think how strong a mind must be that, that is invulnerable. That's, that's our friend uh, Tanya is, wants to name the next movie, the Jesus movie, Invulnerable. I like that word, invulnerable. Christ is invulnerable. That's what I am to teach. That's what I want to teach so I learn it. I want to strengthen it. That's why he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. That's why he said, you can be defenseless. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. Just take that one lesson, in my defenselessness, my safety lies. That doesn't mean in my insurance policy, my safety lies. In my stockpiling food, my safety lies. In my avoiding the coronavirus, my safety lies. In my being in a peaceful place in the world instead of a war-torn, conflictual country, my safety lies. In my defenselessness, in my mind, only my mind can be defenseless. If I'm identified with the body, well, where's the invulnerability in that? If I'm identified with my body, then where's the safety in that? The ego is telling us the body is the home. It, we have to protect our home. It tells us we live in the body, and it, Jesus is like, not close, not even close. So I'm glad you're bringing up the, the suffering idea, because that's the first teaching of the Buddha, that life is suffering. Nada, nada, nada. I'm getting to enjoy that word down here in Mexico. I say it often. Somebody says, suffering. Nada, 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 you know. I do enjoy, te, te amo mucho, 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 mucho. Te amo mucho, 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 mucho. It's, it's a mantra. Just let that come in there. Even in Norway, you can let it come in. Te amo mucho, 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 mucho. You see, you're smiling. You can see how happy that idea is, because it's true. It's a real idea. If you're going to pick a mantra, why not pick the truth? <laughs> you know. So thank you. Thank you for this glorious opportunity to express the happiness. <laughs> yeah, I really see that um, there's such a connectedness of everybody's question, and it's just no um, accident that it all come up in this um, guidance retreat, because truly guidance, what Jesus is guiding us is a mind, in the mind. It's not, the guidance is not really about the body and the crystal balls, or it's, it's a mind lesson. The lesson that um, Lynn Miller, that when you describe that everything works together for good, and even when you were talking about in your hitchhike experience, in the end you saw there is no accident, there is no mistake. That kind of realization is the guidance point to is a mind lesson and and all the questions and all the frustrations that we have that are showing up is this assumption that there is a world that's real and Jesus is going to guide us to go through this world and eventually our mind are so evolved that we pop out of the world 
In the future. In the future. Yeah. <laughs> and the world is a construct that is so solid. There are suffering. There are coronavirus. There are good things. There are bad things. There are family construct. There are this and there are that. And us are a traveler in time and space. And all that we can hope for is our mind can practice forgiveness and find peace and eventually pop out this miserable world. But this is a central thing that is mistaken because there is no world outside of our mind. And how does that, how does that work? As we really accept this, this vision. So what Jesus described in 135, that if you, only, if you can only see that everything works together for good. That is his perspective. That is a unified perspective. And all that we're doing is through his help to be able to reach that perspective. And in that perspective, there is no buts. There is no coronavirus. That is a standalone effect. There is no other aspect but that. And also... As our mind starts to merge with Jesus, this, this world external to us are not going to be the same anymore because they are but a mirror. This world is not a solid construct. There is no such thing as a solid construct where you practice forgiveness. In this solid construct, where you accept spirit's guidance so that you can maneuver this world. It, that is a perspective from the ego. This world is a mirror of our mind. And as we heal the mind, how do we know we heal the mind? We accept the unified perspective and merge it with the spirit. Then this world ceases to be what we perceive as we perceive with the ego. So a lot of the questions... Um, cease to exist in our mind. They don't make any sense anymore. You know, yesterday when, when Jesus talked about this workbook lesson, the salvation of the world depends on me. And I was thinking this is an interesting lesson that comes in the middle of our guidance retreat. And I'm sure because Jesus said, listen to the voice of God to direct you what to do. He put that sentence in that lesson. And I thought, well, this is our guidance retreat. Jesus said clearly, listen to the voice for God to direct you what to do. And all the questions are about how do I hear the voice? How do I know what is the right guidance? I said, if Jesus, Jesus must answer this question. You know, he asks us to listen. He must answer the question. And the whole lesson Jesus is saying this one message, don't play, play weak anymore. Don't pretend you don't know. Don't pretend that you're not worthy for this function. So the whole lesson, there was no instruction as to how do you judge the form? How do you know it's my voice or it's not my voice? Basically, he's just saying, rise up. Rise up and know you're worthy and don't play weak because how can you, how can you not hear when that's, that's what you decide, when that's what you desire? How, how can you being so powerful, a mind that is a son of God who decide to have happiness and, and, and not sure how? That's, that's ridiculous to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that is his answer in the whole lesson that address all questions, basically saying, okay, let's just rise up now. And um, that's why I'm, I, watch, I read all these questions, and I think, you know, that is a question basically saying, okay, there is a mind journey and there is a world. They are both solid. So as I evolve in my mind, how? How do I perceive this solid construct of the world? That's going to remain the same. It's not going to remain the same. There is no world that's outside of the mind. You will not, you cannot imagine how this holistic perception, perception healed perception will look upon. So 
all these questions we can let go, all this self-doubting of what about this? How can I how can I hear? How do I help other people to heal? We can truly let go. Maybe we can just be so humble and saying, okay, if you say that I have that power and I can just choose it, then I will I will say yes. Maybe that question is a form of resistance to say, yeah, but how? Yeah, but what if this? Yeah, but how I how I help my brother who is not completely happy, but yeah, but before that, what about this? So I just think it's really interesting, and I I feel grateful for your questions because it's truly pointing to this one thing that forgiveness offers, which is forgive absolutely everything. Forgive what you think is most certain, which is there is a world that exists outside of you that is now bring you peace. So, you know, in that lesson, I think Jesus also talks about, he says forgiveness is the reflection of love in this world. He basically is saying there is no love in the perceptual world. Love is, is the last step that God would take. But because this world is a reflection, it's all mirror back to what we believe in the mind. Forgiveness is a reflection of the love in heaven. So when I read that, I thought, okay, so if I want, lo- I want to love people here, I might as well just say, I forgive you. That's the best to say I love you in this world. Mm-hmm. And that applies to our family situations. You know, okay, what if I leave what about my family? There is no family that is a, a full, that is a concrete con- contrast outside of my mind that hasn't learned forgiveness. There is there is no such thing. We have to be so open to know forgiveness is such a vast and all-encompassing lesson, and that's why it's adventure. It's adventure to lead to some place that that we can pop through absolutely all of this. So I'm, yeah, I just want to point out this connectedness of all of your questions, you know, and the underlying assumption that's underlying all of that. Yeah. We've come full circle because at the very beginning I was saying, the very beginning of the retreat, that the guidance isn't for time and space. It isn't for the imagination. It isn't for an outcome in time and space, you know, you're, we've come as, all, through all this program, and we, are, where I say the word income, and people think of money. What about in come? Come in side your mind. Income. How's that? Is a different reinterpretation of income. It doesn't cost you a thing to income, to come in. It costs nothing. But income is associated with money, and money is associated with the body and with time. So what Francis is just sharing is, is if your how questions are, okay, Holy Spirit, how do I leave my family, or how do I leave my job, or how do I navigate time and space, you know, use a GPS for that, but the how should be, like Jesus does say once in the Course, he said, There is one question that you can safely ask. One question, he says, that you can safely ask with any situation, with any circumstance. How do I feel? Oh, he's given me one question to ask, and and he's saying, yeah, let go of all your time, space. Imagine that there is no crystal ball. Imagine that you're just a mind with thoughts, and now you're just working with your mind, and there is no world. He does teach that in Lesson 132. He says, there is no world exclamation point. There is no world apart from what you think. And so if, if for one moment I say, okay Jesus, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to say, all right, I'm not going to ask any questions about time and space. I'm not going to ask any questions about learning, nothing about time and space. In fact, as soon as I hear this thought in my mind, practically speaking, how do you exist in the world, 
Jesus is saying, yeah, who is the you that exists in the world? Ha ha ha. No, no, come back. How do I feel? Let's just come back to emotional honesty of how do I feel? You see, that one question at least points you back into your mind. It doesn't point you out on a wild goose chase of time and space. It doesn't point to inside the crystal ball. It actually is more authentic to say, how do I feel? And what if you just use that, how do I feel, in an authentic way to come into, what, what is your will for me? Mm. You were saying that yeah. this morning. Yeah. What is your will for me, is, it seems more honest than, yeah. what shall I do as a person? That yeah. seems like a very inauthentic uh, question compared to, Father, what is your will for me? Or, how do I feel? And what is your will for me? Yeah, because that links to this uh, question from Lynn Perry. That um, Lynn, you, this is a really good question, so I, I want to read it first. Hi, David and Francis. So with giving up the world and letting go of false responsibility, how do you know when you are avoiding love and responsibility? And using this truth to face, to not face what is given. And how does this link with Ken Wapnick's teaching as well as Arden and Persia of just being normal and doing your forgiveness work? So this actually, I have someone asked me this question not so long ago. She um, is going through a divorce right now. And when we know, when you actually take the step to leave a very familiar construct of life, a very comfortable, uh, she was going through a lot of emotion, and she said, you know, with uh, the mind training that you have done um, for all these years, I wonder whether you could just do the forgiveness in, without having to, to uh, divorce and in your own, con in your own family. I felt like when she first said that, I, my mind short wired like it, it feels like I couldn't understand the question. Like a short circuit. Short circuit. <laughs> short circuit is like, it's, it's like, what? How, how, could that, how could that be? I, do, I don't understand the question. And then in the end, after this short circuit went on for a few, few um, seconds, I said, but, but, but that, that will be done. It all comes down to you should be able to forgive in this circumstance if you had the mind training without having to go through these steps. And, and, and I, I found it was really interesting because my mind could not comprehend that hypothetical scenario. And all that I had in mind was, but thy will be done. How, how can that be that I do not follow the script and the will of God and achieve forgiveness. It was completely incomprehensible in my mind. So I was just like, keep, that's the only thing that, that shows up. And I feel that is why it is a very good question to point in the guidance retreat. Because that is true, you know, normal is what, what ego, um, basically construct the world. Normal situation and constructs, separated, certain people you have a relationship with, most of the people you don't have a relationship. And you need to fulfill responsibilities according to those people. These are the responsibilities. And the rest of your identity with God, your peace of mind, they're not your responsibility. Your responsibility is in this world. So that is a total different set of responsibilities that we were taught. So yeah, I was just th thinking, how, you know, this is such a beautiful question, because I, I remember when I was, I heard the big uh, voice, first of all, came from the sky, when I actually just asked that question, what was I to do? And the voice said, just wait here in Australia, for something about to happen in your life. I waited for five years. When David came, 
And I was feeling this calling to leave my life and come over. But in my mind, and also in my perceptual world, all the reflection was selfish, selfish, selfish. What about us? We love you. You love us. Why can't you do the work in this construct? Why can't you do this in the family? Why can't you love us? Why can't you extend <laughs> your love to us? What about us? You love everybody else? <laughs> so that was what I was facing. And I had to really, I mean, I really thought about it in my mind. I thought, okay, let me really get this question clear. Why did I have, why do I have to go? And I thought, you know, I do love my mom. I love my ex-husband a lot. I want to be with them if I can. So let me just jump 10 years of my life and think, what state of mind would I be in? I thought I would be resentful. I would be projecting. I would say, I stayed because of you. I sacrificed for you. I hope you're happy now. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, that's not love. Even I knew that's not responsible. That's not loving. And I cannot equate that with love. Even in my untrained mind, I knew that. I thought if I want to be loving, I need to be inspired. I need to be grateful. And I had no idea. Only God know how I can turn from a bored state of mind, uninspired and resentful state of mind to have a total turn. So since I don't know, my life is yours, God, lead me to that state of mind. And when I left, I knew I left for love. I knew that for a fact. I left for love, for a love that I could tap into so that I can extend to them whenever I think of them. That's why I was saying to say that I love someone is better in this world to say I forgive you because I need to learn forgiveness first and foremost in order to tap into that love. But I think that is a good question just because it also comes back to what is our responsibility and what is a normal life situation. Why can't we do that? Yeah, yeah you know, I think there, there are, when I was reading the Course, and I was going reading the I Need Do Nothing section, I could feel this huge energy starting in my chest. Like these, this huge vibration and this vast energy. And, and I could, it was like Jesus saying, pay attention. And I'm like, but this is the I Need, I need Do Nothing section of the Course. And in a book that has instructions and a workbook and everything, and I'm going, Ooh, what's this? What's this huge fluttering and energy going on in my chest? With I need do nothing, and then it came back again in lesson 189 in the workbook. Simply do this: be still, lay aside all thoughts of what you are and what God is. Hold on to nothing. Do not bring with you one thought the past is taught, what one belief from anything you learned before. Forget this world, forget this course, forget Ken Wapnick, forget David, forget everything, forget everything. Lynn, can you hear this? Forget everything and come with open arms unto your God. Jesus never says be normal. What did Jesus say 2,000 years ago? Be passers-by. He said judge not, be passers-by. If he puts a word after B, and usually he doesn't, he, if, you, if you want, I mean Shakespeare I think had it, to be or not to be, that is the question. The question isn't about being normal. The question is to be or not to be. Jesus says in the Course, we say God is and then we cease to speak. He, he says, now we shall go beyond the words. Actually, all interpretations of what Francis just said of this normal, I have, you know, Jesus is saying, what you believe normal to be is inside of time and space, you know. And, and I am calling you out of the world. I'm calling you out of that crystal ball. You don't think you're going to find any answers inside there. In fact, 
I, I one time I went to the dictionary and, and thesaurus and tried to look up normal and and one of the synonyms for normal is average. Do you think the Christ is average? Do you think the light is average? Do you think before Abraham was, I am, is average? The average is, is in mathematical terms, it's a statistical balancing, it's a statistical word actually, average. If you look at, at what is average, it's, it, you have to divide all of the false beliefs, whether you call them numbers, or people, or things, or circumstances, and you divide them equally, and you come up with a number, and that's the average. And in the world, that's what it is. Now what could Arten and Persa or Ken have been talking about except this? The Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, the Kingdom of Heaven is within you, the Kingdom of Heaven is all around you, the Kingdom of Heaven is everywhere. So, the only meaningful thing we can take from this normal word is right in what seems to be the here and now. Can you forgive? Can you so completely overlook the form? But be right there in a world of appearances where the body's eyes continue to report differences, but in your mind you just have this soft, calm, loving feeling that it's all the same. All the forms are the same. There's no better forms or worse forms. There's no hierarchy of forms. If you can see the sameness in what you perceive, everything. That's why the Course uses relationships, because he's saying, like, okay, here seems to be the appearance of, we'll call them, two people. And, and that's called a relationship. I guess you could call it a relationship. The ego thinks it's a relationship. The ego made it to be a relationship, these two forms. And if, but we know falling in love, we know reaching that place of judge not, we, we know reaching that be passers-by, even with the context of what seems to be physicality, Jesus is saying, I am there with you because I am a state of mind, I am an attitude, I am love, and even with the form of what seems to be in front of you, you can, you can be in peace. Because you don't make any interpretations of what that means. Because the Holy Spirit sees the light beyond the appearances, sees the light of the blazing light of, of the great rays, and these forms will never be able to contain you, they will never be able to ac accurately even represent who you are. But if you can let go of every th thought you have of these forms, and every belief you hold, you can meet in this moment for the very first time. But be normal is actually one of the greatest defenses that the ego came up with to defend against the holy instant. It's one of the, it's this ultimate weapon at stay in time and space. Miracles transcend time and space. Miracles are so, they show you the false is false, they show you the vastness, they show you that your will is universal and can never be content with form of any kind. Be normal, used by the ego, is, is saying that the world is your classroom. And I'm here to tell you right now, the world is not. These situations, family, classroom, interpersonal classroom, all this classroom is phony baloney. The mind is the classroom. The mind is the place where the awakening occurs and you have to bring every single thing back to mind. And that's always the lesson. The lesson, what seems to be art and Persa, seem to be a relationship between a man and a woman, and then enlightenment would have to be, be passers-by with that concept too. Because the truth is not a man and a woman. Those are just witnesses, and the truth of those witnesses would say, be passers-by. So everyone, when I met Francis, when I met Svava, when I met every single one who's in this room, and every one of the thousands and tens of thousands I seem to meet all over the world in all these countries, my message was, I'm calling you out of the world. 
my message was don't settle for normal go for the atonement in the Course in Miracles Jesus says you have only one responsibility he says it twice the sole responsibility of the teacher of God and the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for themselves he's not saying you have worldly responsibilities he's saying you have one responsibility is come back to your mind and accept the correction and don't let anything or anyone or any images distract you from accepting this atonement so this was important I know just to use Francis as an example because when we would have our joinings and discussion it was it's not about Francis as a body leaving a husband or leaving a family behind it's the mind leaving the family Constant. construct behind it's the mind leaving the the political constructs behind you know can you be a fully awakened mind and even understand what politics mean can you even understand what a family is if you want to use the family construct you don't actually leave anything behind you start to realize in your mind is the family of God sometimes people would ask me how is so and so have you seen them lately what is so and so up to and everything I say oh they're doing great uh, did you get an email did you get a phone call no they're doing great because they're in my mind and my mind contains all minds and my mind contains all people their mind is all encompassing it's a, it's a state of mind where you see that there is no world apart from mind there are no people apart from mind there are no lives apart from mind that's why there's no suffering is because there's only one mind and that mind is still part of the mind of God I am an idea in the mind of God that is the answer to everything before Abraham was I am is a beautiful teaching that that the I am presence is one there's only one Christ and that Christ is an idea in the mind of God and and so that's the ultimate of caring and yet to the world to the ego that is spooky spooky what did Einstein call it spooky action at a distance <laughs> even Einstein was frightened of that that unity of that light that's why he said he called it spooky action at a distance he, he started to realize everything of time and space was relative but then he would tell his daughter and he would tell others you know whether you call it God or whether you call it intelligence or whatever you want to call it a, a scientific word for it uh, I mean even even the scientists they have very strange words for unity because it basically dispels all of Newtonian science that's that's why it's so frightening because connectedness doesn't have parts or we could say that in forgiveness you would see beyond the parts you would see the love that is present even with the appearance of parts <laughs> like be not deceived with the perception of fragmentation or the, the perception of parts love is truly all that there is and and how better than to demonstrate forgiveness by having a loving honoring respectful state of mind in relationship to what seems to be the world but you can't do it what Francis is saying you can't you can't do it by trying to define something inside the crystal ball otherwise it's just another story Francis left a husband Francis left a family Francis left a society Francis left China yeah Francis left Australia to the ego there are two options Francis play the the game fulfill the family duty or Francis avoid the duty escaped avoid this is the two two explanation yeah. of the ego. ego yeah you either avoid or you play the game yeah and to the spirit actually Jesus says there is only one way there is one way only one way he says in the same sentence there is one way only one way to free yourself from the imprisonment of your own plan 
which is follow a plan that is not of your making. Period. Follow a plan that's not of your making. To free yourself from every single belief, from your your false responsibility, from either avoiding or playing the game, from all of it. Follow the plan that's not of your making. Yeah. And the ego doesn't really care which of those options right. that you, Francis leaves the family or Francis stays with the family, because either one, it's like, pick either one, you're guilty. <laughs> because it's, there are two options in time and space. It's like, it's like, talk about a paradox, you're guilty if you stay, and you're guilty if you go. If you stay, oh, you play, you stayed in the role, and you stay in, tiny and small in that self-concept. People please. And you people please, yes, 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 honor thy father, mother, and yes, 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 yeah. honor thy partner, yes, 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 whatever you say, whatever you want, yes, yes, yes. Or you go, you abandoner, you rejecter, you, you know, you're going to face the guilt because the question is not solved in time and space and stay and go. It must be that I've heard people say, oh, I stayed and I felt guilty. And then they said, I left. I still felt guilty. So I tried to do it. I went back. <laughs> I still feel I was still guilty. Felt guilty. And then I left again. We actually know people in our community that have stayed and left <laughs> tens of times <laughs> trying to solve the guilt there. And then if you take the normal idea, be normal, well, what's a normal human being? A, a normal human being is one who feels guilty. Why? Because the guilt's in the mind. It's not in the form. And you can try the geographical escape, you can try the financial escape, you can try the, I gotta be me, I did it my way. <laughs> yes, there are times, I'm sure you knew, when I bit off more than I could chew, but through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up <laughs> and I spit it out. Yet through it all, I stood tall and did it my way. It's absolutely inescapable. There is no personal freedom. Jesus says, what do you want, freedom of the body or freedom of the mind, for both you cannot have. He's telling us that there's a purpose in our mind called forgiveness that will set you free, that will really truly set you free. It will take you into your experience of who you are in the kingdom of heaven. And that's a purpose in the mind. It's not a purpose in form. The ego made up all these separate images and, and then it gave a purpose to every one of the separate images, as if there could be, purpose could be fragmented. And Jesus is like, no, no, purpose is unified, that's forgiveness. If, if you're listening to what we're sharing right now, and you're saying, where does it say this in the Course? Can you give me one place where he talks about this? Actually, it's throughout the Course. It's all the way through the Course. But I'm going to give you a lesson to do today, for later on, on Sunday. It's called Homework, and read Lesson 184. If you doubt what, what Francis and I are sharing, and you just want to read one lesson and say, where in the Course does Jesus talk about what you're talking about right now, then you read Lesson 184, and watch your mouth drop open. Like, <laughs> Oh my God, he's spelling it out. He actually spells it out all throughout the Course, but if you want to read one lesson, and if you still are not convinced with this lesson, 184, then you can go to Ken's favorite lesson, and 128 will get you. If you can escape with your normal questions. Be normal, be normal. If you want to be normal, read 184 and see how normal you can be in Lesson 184. And if you still feel you can be normal, then go to Ken's Lesson 128 and read that one. That'll knock the normal out of your mind. If that doesn't do it, maybe you should watch The Matrix again. That'll knock the normal. The one 
Neo accepting himself as the one beyond time and space, that's not normal. That's rare. That's rare. That's absolutely rare. How many people in the history of the United, of, of, of the world, said before Abraham was, I am? Does that sound like a normal thing? Do you hear normal people saying before Abraham was, I am? That was the eternal spirit speaking through a man 2,000 years ago, but that was not a man speaking. If you're dating a man, and the man says to you during the first date, in the, in the middle of eating the mashed potatoes, <laughs> before Abraham was, I am. Yeah, see what that does to the date, you know. See what that does to the date. That, that presence is not looking for a second date. <laughs> that presence could care less about a second date. But I'll tell you, that is, that's, talk about a showstopper. That, that, could bring, that can bring the whole day to stillness. Before Abraham was, I am. Uh, could you elaborate on that? <laughs> I and the Father are one. Okay, date's over. I'm going to take my raspberry pie home and, and eat that at home, and I'll contemplate that. But that is like a date stopper. I and the Father are one. Where do you go from that? You don't go anywhere. But that, that presence takes you into what is real and true. You might as well be saying, you know, you're talking about, you have a date going, you're having a date. What do you think about conspiracy theories? Well, the truth is true and only the truth is true. <laughs> that stops the date. There's no more opinions that follow that line. That's like Ken out on a date, and he says, the truth is true, and only the truth is true. Check, please. <laughs> you know, that's it. That's it. You don't, you don't even get to dessert uh, on that one, you know. That's like right in the mirror. You just leave the meal. You leave the meal. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's actually calling us into the holy instant. He's not saying... You know, I want you to get a little intellectual grasp of A Course in Miracles so you can talk about it with other people. He doesn't want you to talk about it with other people. He wants you to have the experience of I amness and, and then do your Truman Show. In case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. This isn't some kind of a betrayal scene. This isn't some kind of an abandonment scene. You know, when Jesus, at the end, you think with the Apostles, Mary Magdala, Mother Mary, all around, I am with you always, even unto the end of time. Poof! Gone. 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 They say in the Bible he went up into the clouds, but that's, I think he went more higher than that. <laughs> the body disappeared. The body disappeared. There was, there was no need for a body in I amness. There is no need for a body in I amness. So what we're really saying here is don't play small. Don't think you're going to play human and just have an intellectual grasp of A Course in Miracles. What good does an intellectual grasp of A Course in Miracles inside of the crystal ball do you? Does that, does that bring you the experience of heaven? No. It doesn't bring you heaven. You want to be, come to a state of invulnerability where you start to realize suffering is impossible. Not suffering is optional. That's just a bunch of new age spiritual mumbo jumbo. Suffering is optional. Did Jesus ever say suffering is optional? That presence of Christ was so strong that there was no suffering that could be within a, a cosmos or a galaxy of that presence. If they touched the hem of his garden, garment, then it was gone. The, the, it disappeared, you know. Suffering, can I touch your garment? Who touched me? You know, it's like, who touched my vastness, my love? Suffering and Christ don't go together. Christ and normality don't go together. <laughs> They, they, they are not compatible. <laughs> and yet, Jesus is saying, in your presence, 
of who you really are, you will be radiating love and you are not going to be into the push or pull. You're not going to be into, should I stay or go in form? What, what would that even mean to spirit? Hmm, should I stay or should I go? S saith the Lord. <laughs> Just put saith the Lord. No, no, put saith spirit after your statement. Should I be normal or not? Saith the spirit. No way. No way does spirit ask that question. <laughs> because spirit is allness. Spirit is everything. Spirit is vastness without an opposite way beyond the world of opposites, but as long as we're playing crystal ball, we're playing small. And then inside the crystal ball, is this, is this good, is this not good? In the crystal ball there's ethics. In the crystal ball there's morality. Not in spirit. Spirit is the vastness of allness that is all-encompassing, that has no opposite. But don't you know that ethics and morality both have opposites? Because why? They're trying to figure out behavior. Yeah. Is it good? Frances is contemplating leaving her husband and oh, and leaving her family, leaving her country. Is that good or bad? Don't even think that you can solve it inside the crystal wall. Because the ego wants you to, you want to heal. Okay, good, good. As long as you stay in the crystal ball, you can do your Course in Miracles things. Yeah. But that takes you completely out completely yeah, out. Yeah. Ego says stay in some kind of a self-concept and practice with your book. The ego doesn't even care if you just have a Course in Miracles self-concept. Like you're gonna, I'm just gonna be a human and who studies A Course in Miracles. But you can't graduate the Course <laughs> if you hold on to the self-concept because the ego made the self-concept. So you can never graduate the Course. And so if you can't graduate the Course, then it must be you're ignoring this line in this book that says, you will believe this Course entirely or not at all. You're actually making an exception saying, well, I'm, is it okay Jesus if I do the not, as all, not at all, but I become a good Course in Miracles teacher? He's like, what does that even mean? How can you be a good Course in Miracles teacher if you're not happy? If you're not eternally happy, and the Course is not saying, it's the Course is saying a Son of God is happy only in the environment in which He was created, which is Spirit. So the Course is teaching that it's impossible to be happy as, a, as identified as a body. You see what that is? You can't be identified as the body and be eternal Spirit. Because the body is very temporary, it's just a construct. Construct, it's make-believe, and the eternal spirit is real, it's truth, it's divinity, it's oneness, it's love. So he's saying, bring the two together, and you'll realize the illusion's not true, and that you are eternal, you're an eternal being. But you can't be a temporary, time-based, crystal ball creature. You can't be a crystal creature and be the, the Holy Son of God. You can't be both. That's, that's what you're doing. You're just bringing them together and saying, one is real, perfect love, one is not. Cast out fear. That's the Bible. We're back to the Bible. If you just understood one line from the Bible, perfect love, cast out fear, then that would be it. You wouldn't even need to read all the, the books and the Psalms and all the Old Testament, New Testament. You know, it's very complex if you think it's to be found in the words, but it's not. It's not in the words. Well, why don't we open it up? We're, this is, we're having a fun, <laughs> joyful <laughs> expression here. Why don't we get Eric involved and uh, let's, let's, let's all go into this together. This is our <laughs> guidance retreat. <laughs> okay, this is amazing. Um, I see that Thea has her hand up. She wrote to me earlier and had an experience. She was a healing experience she felt to share. So I'll go ahead and unmute you, Thea. Okay. I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. 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 Well, <laughs> thank you for the possibility to share. 
although I feel a lot of fear, but I, this morning I, I felt I had to share because I'm always saying to myself, no, you don't have to share. A lot of other people are sharing. But I know when I feel the fear, I have to do it. And I f felt the urge this morning so big. Well, um, well, because of the movie last night, I saw it uh, for the second time. And, um, well, uh, Kenneth was talking so strongly and with such a good energy. So, um, yeah, I felt it, it um, completed uh, the, the process I was already in. I was in a process of opening my heart and uh, uh, allowing myself to feel everything. So even the most uh, strongest fear. And um, well, that's quite a process. I was going through this morning, uh, well, in Europe it was morning, and um, I was writing in my diary and I was so strong feeling that um, um, that fear in myself of, for opening up to really to the guidance and the, the soft voice in me. And, uh, and I felt that this ego part is so strong. It's so making his stories and getting me out of the present moment. And I was um, uh, trying to talk to myself. Um, yeah, I, I was saying to myself, I wrote in my diary, go inside, darling, to find your truth. The truth about yourself. Trust, trust, trust. Use your courage to surrender to the not knowing Love yourself, appreciate yourself, give it to yourself, invite yourself to receive. And well, I was encouraging myself eh, to go into this. And, uh, and after that, I, I wanted to do something else and I, I wanted to do some work in the garden. And I was doing on my boots and, um, and then I made a movement that I felt a, a very big pain in my back, my lower back. So I couldn't move anymore. And I was hearing this voice inside. And it was saying to me, go inside, go inside, go inside. And well, it was saying to me, go inside yourself. But I went into the house, I went inside. <laughs> and I was laying down myself on the ground because I, I couldn't move anymore. I was only feeling this pain in my lower back. And I was laying there and I was surrendering and I was crying, crying, crying. Like you you were saying, David, crying like a river. As I was crying a river. <laughs> yeah, I was pouring all out. And I, I, there was no story, only the crying, only the crying. So only the opening up of my heart and I was hearing the voice and, and it was really soft and, and, and but I was also hearing the voice of the ego. The ego was, was asking my attention all the time and it was making stories but this time the, the, the soft voice was so strong it took me all up and and the voice used singing to get me into the, the present moment. He was singing to me and I was singing to the voice, yes, I want to listen to you. And <laughs> surrender, surrender, surrender. <laughs> and uh, this, this ego voice was making his stories and uh, to get me out of this. But this time... Uh, it wasn't working and I was really feeling a very soft energy, very comforting energy and I was surrendering to it all and it was a beautiful experience and I was really happy um, to have this experience but also I feel this very strong fear inside to surrender. And um, 
well, now it's okay. But when I was thinking about speaking, expressing myself, my heart was pounding so strong. And but I was, I had, the, was feeling the trust. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> but yeah, I was really experiencing the both in my in my mind together, the ego and the soft voice. And this time the ego was not bigger than the soft voice. <laughs> it was a very nice experience. I was I was so happy and so touched and yeah but, but yeah. So oh, that's I really gift. want to continue yeah. to open my heart and, oh. and uh, give myself permission to feel everything. Yeah, and give myself permission to encourage, encourage myself. And, um, well, with all the mighty companions. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, can I read something more I wrote to myself this morning? Sure. You are free to live with an open heart and a soft belly. Give this to yourself, Thea. Offer yourself the gift to enjoy the softness in your belly. Accept your earthly name, Theodora, which means gift from God in Greek. Give yourself permission to feel at ease, to be in all your beauty and shining. Open up, open up, open up, darling. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. You're speaking for all of us. You're speaking for all of us. Yes. And I noticed with your face beaming and the word softness kept coming out of you and softness <laughs> and softness. That's that's just like such a strong reminder to all of us that that love is gentle, love is kind, love is patient, love is soft. And it reminds me of a song um the Spirit would always be singing, singing to me, serenading me, serenading me throughout the day, just singing and singing, singing. Like a radio station that just has soft love songs all day long, just serenaded. And, and we have to allow that. But this Petula Clark song, it, it's called My Love. It's like, imagine God singing mm. to you and it's, and it's called My Love. My love is warmer than the warmest sunshine, softer than a sigh. My love is deeper than the deepest ocean, wider than the sky. My love is brighter than the brightest star that shines every night above. And there is nothing in this world that can ever change my love. It's so soft. It's like if you if you just stop and still your mind, you can, you can hear this serenading voice that's just singing to us. It's just calling us. It's, we're basking in it. It's just all that there is. And it's, it really wants us to turn away from the perceptual world and say, do not keep looking in this darkened glass for who, for who I am. You will never find the Spirit among the images, but if you can forgive them, if you can just bless every image that you see, if you watch it, the TV or the internet, you just bless every single image that you see with forgiveness, then you'll be able to hear my soft lullaby. My, my, it's more of a wake-up lullaby than a fall-asleep lullaby. So, thank you for your witness, because that's the perfect way for us to, to end our, our guidance retreat with, with you expressing this love, like, 
like come inside, come inside, I love you, don't take a care for the world, I love you so much. You don't have to change anything in this world, just let all things be exactly as they are and receive the love, receive my love. It's so precious, so soft. <laughs> Oh. Oh. <laughs> mm, beautiful. That's beautiful. I feel like this this retreat is is um, some kind of a bridge. Like we pray even to come up with the titles for these retreats, and then in this re retreat was called Guidance, the Direct Path to God, and then, and then the next one that we have is Beyond the Body. God help us with that one. Um, imagine us saying, please write in your expressions and everything, but please keep the theme of the retreat in August in mind, Beyond the Body. So, if, if we ask you to write in, and you do write in, you give us a book each time, you do express, but imagine if we say, stay on theme for, for August, which is beyond the body. Imagine the miraculous expressions. <laughs> I mean, Malfried had a beyond the body experience, and she didn't hesitate to write it out. She had two of them. She had two beyond-the-body experiences, and she did not hesitate to write them out to us. But that's our theme for August, beyond the body. So, Malfried's, your, your expression would be great, and, and basically that's what we just were hearing too. We were hearing about softness and song and come inside. All those things are really on theme yeah. for, for our next retreat. <laughs> Yeah, it's, that's, that's our experience, that all things work together for good. Your contribution brings that experience, because it's like this, this, the Spirit is guiding this retreat through you, through us, and we all have this experience which, in the end, it just closes off with the most soft song and whisper. Yeah. That's... Yeah. And to me, you know, the thing I really feel like, I... I picked up this Course in Miracles back in 1986 um, out in La Jolla, California at a humanistic psychology conference with Carl Rogers. And the one thing I can say about guidance is I've always, always felt that the guidance of Jesus is practical. I never felt it was, it was theoretical. I never felt it was um, beyond me. I always felt that Jesus was always speaking to me in, in a soft tone with very, very realistic, practical guidance. And then I shared with you that I, I discovered through those 34 years of listening and following with Jesus, He, he, he said, Are you get, do you get it now? It's about the present moment. It was never about doing something in time and space. It was never about being inside of the crystal ball. It's just this feeling about being above the battleground. It's a feeling of transcendence. It's a feeling of, of joy and happiness that is, is actually so in sync and so aligned with, with spirit that that's how you can relax and be clueless about the world. That's, to be clueless about the world and to be in presence is really lesson number one. Nothing I see means anything. With a left, with a ha ha ha, too, like with a, without a, a concern, without a fear, without a doubt. So, it's so practical. Now, as we talk about beyond the body, what I'm saying is, what if the most practical thing that you can offer to Jesus is to observe the crystal ball without judgment. Is just to see it completely neutralized and, and see it from a state of, of non-judgment. 
And that would be, I think, a good way to go into our beyond the body. Because the body is where? It's in the crystal ball. And our mind is not inside that crystal ball. In fact, that crystal ball is, is still in our mind. Ideas leave not their source, but it's, it's harmless when you see it with the Holy Spirit in mind. When you see it as an external projection, it's crazy, it's wacky. Oh, I've got, my body's too fat, my body's too skinny, my body's too old, my body's too young, my body's too ugly, my body's, my body's too tired, you know, my body's too energized. Uh, you know, it, you see, as long as we project from our mind onto the body and onto the world, then Jesus is just quietly saying, come back. Because Jesus and the Holy Spirit can't destroy what the ego made. They don't even know what destruction is. But they do know what forgiveness is. They, knew how, they know how to see it differently. They know how to observe it in a state of pure acceptance and pure non-judgment. They, they are not uh, that's something that Ken would always say, the Holy Spirit doesn't act in the world. The Holy Spirit isn't inside pulling the levers. The Holy Spirit is just offering a forgiven world and saying, hey, watch with me. See, see how peaceful it is to watch with me. And so, to me, that's definitely beyond the body. That's, that's still practical. We're not denying that there seems to be images there. We're just saying, don't, don't try to judge them as good and bad and right and wrong and all the, the dualities. Don't try to find the meaning in the crystal ball. Just come inside with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and see the world with them. So that's, that's got to be the ultimate guidance. If you had one guidance to hear, <laughs> that's the one. That's the one. That's the, that's the one that sets you free, that frees your mind, as, as Morpheus was telling Neo. Yeah, because David was telling me this morning, someone wrote to, to him to ask, have you ever healed sickness with A Course in Miracles? And he said, yes. And he said, is that something really serious sickness? David said, yes. And he said, what? David said, separation. That's, <laughs> that's like that's, everything. That's my morning chat. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, big, very yeah. practical, right, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Separation, yeah. <laughs> That's a beyond the body topic. That's about. a beyond the body top, topic for sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.